Hello and welcome everyone. What a delight it is to be with you here in Flyleaf Books, although I'm the only one here with my colleagues, but uh, I know that you're here in spirit and we feel your presence. Uh, so welcome to today's Humanities in Action event. This is our final Humanities in Action talk. Um, we're so delighted to get to it. We had originally scheduled this talk back in April and we have persevered and we're able to do it today. So we're delighted for that. Before we begin, I want to uh, thank, of course, uh, a few people and sponsors. We want to thank our wonderful sponsors at the Cotton Merker Group and Morgan Stanley for being uh, such great partners with ours, especially underwriting our K-12 programs. Carolina Meadows, a wonderful retirement community here in Chapel Hill, who has been a partner of ours promoting our events, uh, especially our adventures and ideas and humanities in action events, so we're thankful for their support. A great partner all uh, fall and of course all the time, but especially this fall as we do this online virtual work is the General Alumni Association. Uh, so we want to thank them for all of their partnership and I'll mention a program we're doing in partnership and collaboration with them shortly. Uh, and of course, I want to thank Flyleaf Books, which is, uh, as I say, a sure sign of civilization is a fully functioning independent bookstore. And we are so blessed to have uh, Flyleaf Books here. Jamie and Talia and all of our friends here have been so uh, well, uh, gracious and welcoming us into this space where we can use it as a studio. We miss seeing you here, but um, Flyleaf Books is now open, folks. So come on by. They have a limited access to the store. And of course, they have their wonderful curbside uh, uh, curbside service as well if you're interested uh, in buying books come on down to Flyleaf Books folks and also check out their wonderful events on their own. I need to of course thank uh, my colleagues Vicki Breeden who is monitoring things uh, remotely for us uh, at Carolina Public Humanities at our home office and of course my dear friend uh, Paul Bonici who uh, over the course of the last few months has transformed himself into a, a production engineer and it's just uh, most remarkable. So thank you, Paul, and thank you, Vicki, and of course all the staff at Carolina Public Humanities who have been such a help uh, for us. Um, before we begin, I want to mention a few events coming up, uh, actually quite a few events. We're getting towards the end of our semester and they're kind of stacking up on each other. It's good to know we'll have a busy next few weeks. Uh, we are in the middle of the Ida B. Wells Symposium, which is a series of, of uh, wonderful uh, uh, events and talks, including the great keynote that we had with Hannah Nicole Jones a few weeks ago. And uh, we also had a wonderful talk with uh, Kathy Williams, uh, actor Kathy Williams, uh, who discussed her work on Ida B. Wells. We talked about that last week uh, on our Lunch with Friends and Strangers program. But this, oct uh, this October 18th, Sunday, you can see the reading. Kathy B. Williams will be doing uh, reading from the play on Ida B. Wells' life, and it should be absolutely fascinating. Uh, and so a little bit of a a dramatic portrayal there, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that as well. As I mentioned, uh, Kathy spoke with me uh, on uh, last Friday as part of our Lunch with Friends and Strangers program. This is a partnership with the General Alumni Association, something we're vo uh, very proud of, informal talks, uh, biography talks. Um, and we have our next one coming up next Friday, uh, October 23rd, will be with uh, uh, Professor Don Raleigh talking about Leonid Brezhnev, the, the Soviet leader I remember best. Uh, that's my that's my invitation there. Uh, also, a whole lots, a bunch of events I want to mention. October 20th, we have a special uh, encore presentation in coordination with Sandals Community College of uh, Richard Talbert's talk on dictators, Roman dictators from Cincinnati to Caesar. That's on October 20th. That night on October 20th, another great partnership with the General Alumni Association is Consider This Elections. This is a panel discussion with five, uh, uh, five scholars from UNC from various departments, uh, and we'll be having uh, plenty of opportunity for questions, um, people's expertise ranging from uh, social media and politics to the law and politics to women's issues uh, to issues of race, um, just about everything that you could think of related to the election. Please come on by, consider this. Uh, October 20th. Um, also, next week, October 21st, we have uh, a very special event. This is not part of a series, but our colleague in the history department, Brett Whalen, who uh, spoke with us on the radio back in the spring about the plague, was so inspired. I like to think he was so inspired by our conversation that he went on to uh, publish a book on uh, lessons from the medieval plagues, and he'll be giving a talk uh, next Wednesday, October 21st at 3.30. We'll be filming that here at Flyleaf Books on the Plague. Uh, 
our f- a great, uh, we want to thank Vicki Breeden and the folks over at the Ackland for putting together this wonderful Big Read project. This is a, uh, a project focusing on LGBTQ voices and experiences. Uh, it's a part of the National Endowment for the Arts grant called the Big Read. And our title for this one is Advice from the Lights. So this is a whole series of events, and it kicks off on October 21st, and we have a book group on October 22nd and 23rd, the first of the Big Read uh, reading groups. Um, my colleague Paul will be dropping some of these things into the chat box as, uh, as I mention these, or we'll get them up there eventually. Uh, also, we have on October 24th, uh, our Cities of Music, which is uh, one of our dialogue seminars. We'll be looking at Nashville and Vienna, um, and we'll be taking that subway that goes onto the Atlantic between those two wonderful cities of music. Uh, we don't often think of them together, but they're both absolutely centers of music and should be a fascinating talk with Jocelyn Neal and includes live performances of pieces by pianist Robert Buxton uh, of pianists who spent a lot of time in Vienna. And finally, uh, we have other events. I want to drive you to our website, humanities.unc.edu, or follow us on Facebook. But I should also mention that we have our last weekend seminar coming up uh, the day after the election, November 4th and 5th, on Heaven and Hell with Bart Ehrman. Uh, Fittingly, after the election, no matter what your persuasion is on this election, one of those will fit your attitude, I think. So come on by. Uh, And of course, Bart Ehrman is a fantastic uh, speaker. Uh, and and has and completely compelling information uh, on biblical exegesis. Those are upcoming programs. We want you to, of course, go to humanities.unc.edu and check those out. Uh, I also want to thank uh, everybody who is here today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for continuing to support Carolina Public Humanities. Uh, many of our friends are showing up for these. Many new folks are showing up through the General Alumni Association. We do hope Someday in the bright future, we'll be doing programs live again, but we've learned how to do this, and hopefully we'll be able to reach those of you who can't make it to Chapel Hill. So thank you for tuning in. Thanks to our uh, advisory board members who are always there supporting us. And I want to just remind everybody, if you would like to help us with our outreach to uh, communities like the K-12 through teachers that we work with throughout the state or the community colleges that we do uh, such great programs with, uh, we could use your support, folks. So please consider giving to uh, Carolina Public Humanities. Uh, Of course, gifts of any size are greatly appreciated and are all tax deductible. So thank you for considering that. And uh, it's now time for me to thank our uh, speaker today for persevering with us. Dr. Lenise Williams is from the Department of Art and Art History. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my introduction, was originally scheduled to do this talk um, in April. And uh, something struck, something the whole world changed, but we have persevered and and, and have uh, uh, brought Dr. Williams to give this talk. What is interesting is that this talk was originally part of a series that we were doing on technology and society. And we were going to be looking at various aspects of how um, culture and society and politics are affected by technological advances. Uh, Since we scheduled this talk, our country has gone through an incredible uh, realization and reawakening uh, or re-reckoning, if you will, with our racial heritage and with systemic racism in this country. So this talk uh, is, is a fitting talk to talk about technology, but is, of course, absolutely a fitting talk to talk about systemic racism, and we hope to get the art historical appreciation of this. Um, It's great uh, to bring in someone from the art history department because artifacts and media are in fact embedded with all sorts of social clues and social uh, prejudices. So uh, without further ado, I want to mention, of course, we have Dr. Lanise's bio in the uh, the chat if you are interested in learning more about Dr. Williams. We're not going to read whole CVs here. We're just going to say thank you for persevering with us, and I will now turn the floor over to Dr. Lenise Williams, who will be talking about erasing the historical record. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Lenise Williams. And we don't shake hands, but I will wave to you. Come on in. Thank you all for coming today. Um, I really, I really mean that deeply. I know these are very, very challenging times, and they're challenging times for every single person in some way to some degree so even something that would seem simple like coming to sit and listen to a talk can be really complicated so I thank you for choosing this I also want to thank Max and Paul and Lloyd because it was Lloyd last year who asked me to do the talk so thank you for doing that and Vicki thank you for your emails also 
It's fun. It's a, in many ways, it's really appropriate that I present my talk to you in a remote format because it's a tr at the center of what I'm talking about is transform transformation technology. And that's exactly what's happening here. I'm speaking to you, but it's being transformed through the technology of the cameras into something that you're actually seeing in your house. So it makes perfect sense. So the title of my talk is, as you can see, Erasing the Historical Record. Um, let me show you what the plan is. So first I'm going to talk about my art historical project because the interventions that I talk about later are all coming from an art historical project. Then I'm going to talk about a roadblock that I hit in that project. And it was because of that roadblock that I did a pivot just a slight pivot to identify some decisions around erasure that I was picking up on. And then finally inserting art historical methods and perspectives into computational treatments of archives, including artificial intelligence and machine learning. So starting at art history and then moving into that intervention. So the project, generally speaking, I'm working on a book on the creation of the glamorous black athlete as a visual type in mass produced media in 1920s Paris. Um, actually, it starts in 1920s Paris and then it moves into the United States because the image is circulating in newspapers. Um, and it's, it's at a particular point where black, the, representation shifts from depictions of distorted brutes and barely legible dark masses and threatening figures into radiant, glossy celebrities that form the foundation of the larger-than-life superheroes that we know of in the present. I center on the representations of the portrayals of a black Panamanian boxer, Alfonso Teofilo Brown, who was world welterweight champion between 1929 to 1936 and then again in 1938 to 1941. And I'm drawing from a lot of different types of archival sources. I'm look with a particular emphasis on newspapers, sports newspapers, general newspapers, posters, advertisements, fashion magazines, as well as the technologies that produce those various meat um, products, and I analyze rep performance also. So, so I'm, what I'm getting at is that the seed of this intervention is my art historical research. It totally drives that intervention project. This is a new paradigm of justice in the archival science and computational techn technology sector. So, Another critical piece here is materiality and issues around an actual object. Um, what you're looking at projected is a high resolution image of an actual object. But here is the actual object. If you were here, I could actually show you this. So let's take a deeper look into the project. This is a, a 2016 Nike advertisement for the Kobe 11 line Black Mamba. Now if I ask you to tell me what you saw, I might get a variety of answers such as, it's Kobe, yes. It's a Nike ad, yes, you know, and so forth and so forth. All of those answers would be accurate. But when I look at this, I also see a series of decisions. Someone or a group of people made, a, made decisions about how they wanted that image to appear. And I'll show you how that works. Kobe's head is disembodied. The purple outline is a highlight to emphasize the fact that his head is not only disembodied, but it's, it's unattached from his body, but it's shown in profile. 
There's strategic lighting on his face that highlights his cheekbones and other features like his forehead and his chin, suggesting depth. His skin has been edited by using Photoshop to give the illusion of a flawless surface. The decision makers of this image had a lot of other choices. They could have um, photographed him standing up. It could have been a frontal pose. It could have been an action shot. But they chose these particular components because of the work they wanted that image to do. Decisions, decisions, decisions. I wrote it this way because oftentimes, you know, you, you get put on these committees. You have to make these you know, you get these memos and these memorandums telling you, you know, you've got to make decisions about this. And so they often seem like they're trivial, but the implications of those decisions are much bigger and much more significant. Part of the work I do as an art historian is to disassemble an image or an object in order to lay bare the decisions and the selections that are made to give the object or the image its form. So, and I want to think about, you know, what other choices did they have? Why did they choose to make it look like this? Why did they choose this medium and not another medium? All of that is really interesting because what has been chosen is really shaping how you understand it and how you remember that. So I get a, a much deeper understanding of how the cultural forces like attitudes and even materials shape and construct meaning of visual expressions. You know, for example, some components of an image may call up an existing set of ideas that people would immediately recognize. There may be colors used that, that are tied to, a, to something that viewers might know. You know, so when they see that color, it automatically signals something else. It may be that the, everything is arranged, the composition is arranged in a way that tethers it to particularities in that particular society. All of those considerations, among many others, will contribute to my interpretation. And here is my interpretation of this image. Okay. Nike depicts Kobe Bryant as a conjured enigma. They offer up an idealized, heat-retaining cranium in profile as a visual summation of his otherworldly skills on the basketball court. His head emerges from a red and black formless energy source, perhaps like the term Black Mamba, a term he chose from the film Kill Bill. But the, but the term, especially in that context, carries associations of distorted U.S. ideas about mystery and foreboding linked to Afro-Cuban religions, Santaria and Lukumi. Photographer's lighting accentuates high cheekbones and flawless glowing skin. This is supposedly the unvarnished natural skin of men, where shine and shadow are valued as go-to strategies for playing up manly angularity. Kobe's image codifies a carefully sculpted masculinity that relies heavily on flash photography, saturated color, Photoshop, and the photomechanical reproduction methods that convert the image for the internet, mag magazines, and billboards. Images such as this one of beautiful black male athletes are ubiquitous in contemporary American and global culture. We take them for granted in the 21st century. But actually, the merger of aesthetic ob objectification in black male athletic bodies is relatively new. The black athlete as an aesthetic glamorized object first emerged in 1927 Paris. It birthed fo birth forth on the image on the left hand side from the magazine Match L'Entron, features black Panamanian boxer Alfonso Teofilo Brown, 
welterweight champion, as I mentioned earlier. And at this moment, Match Lentron was one of the most widely circulated sports weeklies. And when I look at that image, I'm looking at the complex intersection of photography, particularly glamour photography associated with the cinema, and rotogravure, which is the printing process of the newspaper, and it was cutting edge in 1920s. And then a lot of new strategies in graphic design, all of which I'm going to talk about. So there's the image. Okay. You're looking at the high resolution image of this, but the object itself, I found it at a flea market in Paris in 2009 on the outskirts. I was browsing. I had come from an archive. I was going back to the apartment where I was staying. I come up the steps from the train and there's a giant flea market. And I like flea markets. So I walked through this flea market, and there, on, there were stacks and stacks of newspapers in this one area. And at, on the top of the stacks was this newspaper. I was so taken with how he appears in a close-up headshot format, which is more in common with a Hollywood cinema star than a battle-scarred boxer who participated in the bout the night before. It's, and it stuck out for two other reasons. It bucked all the prevailing trends of 1920s Paris, where circulating representations of black men were pretty much dominated by visual strategies that denigrated and dehumanized them. That was the first reason. Oh, that's the second reason. But then, just the idea that mass media was using a black male body to articulate ethereal light and cropping that's attached to photography's associations of glamour, that's really different. It completely defied everything I was used to seeing. And I'll show you some of what was popular at the time. On the left-hand side, Paul Collin, his poster from 1925 for La Revue Negre, there are two, okay, so, this is his poster. He is borrowing the visual strategies, the way um, artists portrayed lips and eyes and physiognomy of African Americans. On the right hand side is cover some sheet music from the US. That's circulating in Paris. And this artist in 1925 is borrowing from that to depict Josephine Baker and these two black male musicians. So these were appeared in huge posters all over Paris. Same artist Paul Collin on the left on the right side this time. This is a part of his full portfolio where he is talking, uh, where he is also representing a variety of black figures in Paris at the time. And again, he's using that same visual language of menstruacy, but he's combining it with Art Deco, the Art Deco style here. Um, <clears throat> you can see the lips and the eyes are very much reminiscent of the sheet music on the other side. And, but the Art Deco comes in because the exaggerated form pushes the black male figure really far away from any um, signs of humanity. His back is acutely arched. His skin is monochromatic and absent of any nuanced suggestion of any underlying skeletal structure that would signify his humanness. On his face, the creases and folds that give rise to the smile are completely absent. It's just sort of pasted onto his face. And he marks, so the artist marks him with a broad, humanly impossible, rictus grin of menstruacy. The black male is desexualized, a comical decoration that furthers a modernist Art Deco style. That was, okay, so you've got these two ways in which images around Paris, people would have seen those, those, these types of images. But they also would have seen these. Um, sports cartoons are 
are just beginning to take off, I would say, 1910 in Paris. And so there are two representations here of African-American boxer Jack Johnson. On the left side, in the bottom right corner, he's depicted as a jovial beast. Um, he's got tiny little legs that m seem impossibly holding up his giant bulky chest. He has a tiny little pinhead, which, su which suggests that it's an, it, it's an it, the head can't possibly contain anything to, to, that suggests any type of intelligence according to the gesture of his body and the proportions of his body. On the left hand, on the right hand side, he's depicted as a dangerous, savage brute who is threatening and is surrounded by the, um, I guess, the after effects of his behavior. So if you think about all those images and then you look at this, you'll get a sense of why I was shocked. It was the materiality of the newspaper. Materiality meaning the physical object that led me to investigate how the image was translated and printed onto the paper. And materiality in this case, the paper's very smooth. In fact, it's satiny smooth. I did a little research on that, which I will talk about. So yeah, touching and examining the physical paper prompted a lot of questions. Like, why does he look so distinctly different here than his appearance in the cartoons or other newspapers of the day? And why does the paper have that satiny sheen to it? So let, let's stop and consider the newspaper's printing process. Most people think of images in newspapers as photographs, but that's not technically correct. They're photomechanical reproductions. And you see the definition here. It's a printing process where the surface is prepared using light combined with chemicals and a mechanical treatment. And in the case of rotogravure, that the, an image is translated to a copper cylinder. The image is etched into the cylinder with light and chemicals, but light is not needed for the next step, which is to apply ink to the cylinder and roll, news, roll newspaper print underneath it. So. That sounds a little technical, but here, here's, how, here's the part, okay. It's the process that takes place after the image has been captured onto the film. We don't think much, much about that phase because in terms of reproducing images, because technology like what we have in our smartphones shrinks that time to a split second. When you take a photograph of somebody with your smartphone and you press the button, by the time you lift up, the image is there. In that split second, that's what I'm talking about. That's the pro a process of photo mechanical reproduction happens in that sec session. So that's, I wanna talk about that, I wanna focus on that. And I wanna focus on it because the innovation of early 20th century rotogravure, this technology, which I'll talk about, from what was being used called halftone was a dramatic transformation for representing black skin and ideas about blackness. Now, how distinctive was that? How distinctive is this image compared to other newspapers of the time? Well, all the other newspaper, the majority of the other newspapers of the time are using the halftone photomechanical process. And here we see an image on the right, which is a halftone reproduction of the photograph of Michael Jordan on the left. So halftone is a type of engraving that uses a grid like screen, screen of dots of different sizes. And halftone itself really was innovative when it first um, when they first started to use it in the late 19th century because it allowed photographic images to be printed alongside type. That couldn't happen before that. 
and it allowed that to be printed on inexpensive paper. But the medium fell short of transforming the full range of photography's possibility. And it didn't even matter if the photograph contained an unlimited number of tonal nuances or a sharply focused subject. As you can see, the image on the left is very sharply focused, but once you print it in halftone, that's what it looks like, the image on the right. Muted, you hardly see any sharp edges, there's an absence of focus there, actually. So, look at what Al Brown looks like in halftone. And that's taken from another sports newspaper. This is what everybody's using, halftone. And you can, as you can see, his face is, is barely discernible. It has a half tone has a detrimental impact on black phenotype. It's absolutely obvious here. It it doesn't reduce them to flat colored tones like Paul Collins work, but it certainly pushes black bodies in that direction rather than towards the subtleties and details that signal the richness of humanity. Okay, so I want to circle back now to the beginning of my talk where I talked about how my role as an art historian included identifying decisions made by the makers and the choices from which they made their selections. So I want to think about that. So, Match made a choice to use rotogravure. Rotogravure is a photomechanical printing process. Okay, so it turns. Um, it's etching onto, it's a combination of photogravure and a textile printing process. Photogravure was used to print um, photographic images in high detail because it was able to record the entire range of photography's tones. That got combined with a um, cylinder, as I mentioned before, and so detect rotogravure, all the benefits were transferred in rotogravure to inexpensive paper. That's what, that's what you're seeing here. So they're making a choice, but they didn't make the choice because they wanted to represent black people differently. They didn't have that in mind. They made the choice because rotogravure allowed for, for a whole different way of working with images. Most newspapers didn't have, didn't privilege images. They didn't have big images. The match newspaper there, this is an 11 by 17 inch newspaper. It's huge. Most newspapers are much smaller and they have tiny little images. So with rotogravure, they could cut and paste the, in fact, okay, they could make these photo montages, photo montages that we're looking at. And they could do them because instead of using a negative, Rotogravure uses film positive. This is the beginning of the um, early on, the invention of cell, celluloid film, thin acetate plastic. They're making film positives with that, and then they are l laying things on top of each other. The layout artist was invented because of rotogravure. The art director, as a role, was invented in graphic design because of rotogravure. So the technology sparked all these new inventions of tools and roles of labor and in graphic design, but it also meant that they could experiment to see what it could do. And that's probably how they came up with that image. That's probably how they came up with the image. They, they, because all of a sudden they saw that this technology could do a lot more than what Halftone could do. And so it's in the photo montages you can see experimentation there. So they are also going to experiment with their ideas around blackness. And I mentioned before that 
there were a few other, there were only four other magazines using Rotogravure when Match started to use Rotogravure in the Sports News Weekly. This is an example of one of them. And as you can see, it's a, it's a photograph, it's this focused on World War I. This Rotogravure opened up brand new ways of imaging World War I. First of all, it, it, it opened up ways in which a photograph could appear on newsprint. That was totally new. This Rotogravure is the reason Life Magazine could be Life Magazine. And Life Magazine started after Match came out. Because there's a way in which images are prioritized. There's a way in which they, um, the staff, the art directors want to draw you in through an image. But the only way that that could be done is if you had the technology that could make an image play with the, what photography already um, projects, which is this whole myth of truth, this myth of reality. That's what we see happening here. So, choices, decisions at the top to manipulate rotogravure by using glamour strategies. The same magazine had a sports newspaper. That's what you're looking at there. Here it is right here. This newspaper came out on the exact day as this one. Same one. Two different types of images, you see. On the left side... Match is using s strategies of glamour. They're using a tight close-up on the uh, that looks sort of like a headshot. On the right side, they're photographing the image from a distance. They're photographing the boxer in action. That's not tied to glamour photography. On the right, on the left side, the glowing skin, the way that you light it, the top light. That's part a part of how Hollywood photographers were photographing film stars. And you can see the similarities here in this photograph of Rudolph Valentino. How the light strikes him at the top, how his skin looks like he's glowing, how there's a real how the camera brings him very close to his face and also close to your face, consequently. Photography is interesting. It's, it's, in fact, it's very interesting. I think your microphone fell off. No problem. <laughs> okay. The fact that photography is being used here is really quite interesting because of some of the tacit biases in photography. Um, Richard Dyer has observed that the photographic media assume privilege and construct whiteness. The apparatus was developed with white people in mind. Photographing non-white people is typically construed as a problem. That comes through, well, I'll talk about that in a moment. In terms of the biases, the Shirley card. The, this is a card that was used as a reference, generated in the 1940s at Kodak, when Kodak was selling just about all of the color film used by everybody around the world. And so what would happen is you'd photograph something, and then you'd take your film in to be developed. The machines that were used to develop that film were calibrated with this card. They sent these cards with all the machines to calibrate the tone, the shadows, and the light. So all of the film is being calibrated to a white woman's skin. So that's building that bias into photography itself. And um, it's still a part of how we talk about things today. It's still happening today. If you remember the January 15th, um, episode of Blackish. It opens with Rainbow 
picking up the phone and yelling at the um, principal of Jack and Diane's school, and there's Diane. Diane came home with the class photograph, and in that photograph, you could see everybody except her. The photograph didn't, he didn't light the whole scene with dark, dark skin and light skin. He calibrated it to light, to light skin, and therefore she was cast in the shadows. And this is, um, now while that is fiction, because that's a television show, there are articles that have come out recently um, where the director, Ava DuVernay, talks about the fact that she wasn't taught how to light. Film schools don't teach how to light darks and lights in the same scene. Film schools, um, film programs at the historically black colleges and universities do, and that's where you know, the people that go there can learn that, but outside of that, in other film schools, they don't teach that. Which brings me to this. Technology is not neutral. Technology is designed and constructed by human beings living in specific contexts with specific values. Human beings have biases. Good ones, bad ones, the whole range. And those biases are built into the technology they create. If I hadn't found this hard copy of the newspaper, <clears throat> this is what I would have had to work with on the left-hand side. Because when I went into a digital database to look for other copies, other issues of Match Lentron, I went into the database and I saw this. And if you look at that closely, um, there is no path to lead me to think about glamorizing strategies in that image. There's no path to lead me to think about photomechanical reproduction and something so revolutionary as rotogravure that's even in existence that could transform the way black skin could look. That's what I would have had to work with. So this is an archival representation of the high resolution image that you're looking at on the right hand side, which is also a transformation of this hard copy. So, okay. I wanted to find out if this image of Al Brown on match was the first image of a black athlete represented this way. So in order to do that, I had to look at all of the images in, that were printed in Rotogravure before 1927, which really wasn't that difficult because it's a cutting edge um, process and it's expensive to set up. So I could look at the five um, sources in Germany. I could go through those, but there weren't any black people represented there. I could look at the eight publications in the UK, and I looked through those, and I didn't find any images of any black people there. And then I thought, oh, I should look in the US because there are African-American newspapers and maybe somebody has something. Okay, so I found that the New York Times bought a press, a rotogravure press, in 1913. This is the type of thing that they're doing with their rotogravure press. So I did some further research, but that's a representation from an archive. But some further re research, I found that the Philadelphia Tribune, which was an African-American newspaper, bought a rotogravure press in December. No, they bought it before December, but they were going to publish their anniversary issue, which was December 31st, 1926. And I thought, wait, 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 wait. That's before this image. So I was very excited about this, very excited. So I start going to libraries to find the newspaper. And I'm going to libraries, and, and they're all telling me the same thing, which is, oh, we don't have hard copies. We only have the digital images. What you want is the digital images. And I kept saying, no, actually, I don't want the digital image because in 1926, that's not what people saw. 
I need to see what they actually saw. There was no digital images in 1926. So I'm looking for the newspapers. And because in newspapers, look at, this is what I'm finding. This is how African Americans look at newspapers. I mean, there's a whole range of images, but mostly this is, these are some of the better ones on the left side, and these are some of the worst ones on the right side. This is what we have. And I look at that and I say, I could never use that. If I was, if, you know, if I'm looking at representations of black people and the long trajectory of it, and newspapers are the most widely disseminated medium of these representations up until what? 2006, I would say, when the first digital newspapers, and this is what they look like? That's when I hit the roadblock. Because nobody has them. Nobody has the newspapers. I have looked all over. I've gone to the historically black colleges and universities. I've gone to the Library of Congress. They tell me the same thing. No, no, Dr. Williams, you want digital image. And I say, no, I don't want digital images. I really need to see what they saw. And they say, we don't have them anymore. So I did some research. And in that research, what I actually observed is that microfilm, microforms, and digitizing employed in newspapers for archives and libraries strip away all the revolutionary advances made by Roto Reviewer. Everything this has in terms of showing you subtleties is gone in the image on the left. Microfilm is made to record high contrast. That's what the film is made for. Darks and lights, which lends itself to text. Um, any tone that falls in between a very dark and a very light is going to be distorted. And that's where most people of color fall. Even some white people fall in that area of distortion. But it's very different because White people have a backdrop of an entire culture where they are imaged as the ideal. But black people didn't have that in the 20s and they still don't have that. And so this is all you have and this is the way. So I was very curious, how did this come about? So transformation technology and the decisions to use these particular ones have erased already marginalized people of color from the historical record. It's already done, and it didn't have to be this way. OK, so I did some work. OK, so we know how microfilm is made now. but. In the Earl, okay, so in 1930, 1929, two years after this was published, the Library of Congress starts experimenting with microfilming. By 1940, they're really pushing microfilming. And they're pushing it because they're telling libraries and archives, microfilm lasts five, 500 years. That's true. It's difficult. To, they're telling them it's really difficult to um, preserve newspapers. Also true. They get brittle. They fall apart. They take up space. All true. So they're talking about efficiency in, in terms of efficient space, use of space, because all li most libraries need more space all the time. Things are constantly coming in. They're always trying to fight for more space. And so now there's this microfilm that makes it last longer. But there are racial implications with microfilm. There are, if you just look at it, you would see that it's not recording everybody evenly. And then in 1999, when the Library of Congress starts experimenting with digitizing, 
the first things they digitized were newspapers, and they got a lot of money from Congress to do this, and the National um, Humanities. But they're not digitizing hard copies because they've thrown out, they've advocated for people to throw out the newspapers when they started to microfill them to free up space. They're digitizing the microfilms. So every time you go into a library right now or go on your computer and you pull up a newspaper from any archive that's pre-2006, when the first digi digital-born newspapers began, you're going to see a hard copy of a newspaper that's been transformed by microfilm and, that's, and then that gets transformed by a digital process. That's two levels of transformation. These are examples, these are some of the technical guidelines um, that have come out that talk about this is, that make rules about digitizing. These are the technical guidelines for digitizing cultural heritage materials, and these are the FAGI um, guidelines, Federal Agencies Digital Guidelines Initiative. And it talks about, you know, it's very specific about how many pixels that you use to digitize. The interesting part about all of these guidelines is that there's no discussion of any implications. None. They're just technical spec specifications. That's it. More cultural and social analysis I applied to this? Okay. In 1914, Woodrow Wilson increased the segregation of the federal offices. There were no people of color at the Library of Congress when those decisions were made. And the people who were there, who are living in the Jim Crow era, are not concerned with what people of color look like in microfilm. So the decision makers failed to consider the technology's racial implications. Transformation technology and choice and the choice to use these particular ones have already erased marginalized people of color from the historical record, I repeat. But it doesn't have to be this way. This is where intervention. Um, in summer of 2019, July 2019, I created the Vera Collaborative. Vera Collaborative is an interdisciplinary center that advocates for culturally responsible archival practices that address the significant erasures in visual, material, and historical representation disproportionately affecting communities of color. I did this in response to a memorandum that was sent out by the National Archives and Records Administration in June of 2019 that talks about this transition to electronic records. Mo basically, it states that after December 31st, 2022, the National Archives and Records Administration is no longer accepting any paper documents. Everything has to be electrical. Everything has to be digitized. And I thought, I don't, it, well, actually, I was working on a book manuscript that summer. I put that down, and then I pulled 10 years of guidelines for, Nash, for NARA. Because I was curious to see, how were they thinking about these implications? I pull the guidelines, there's no consideration. The guidelines are filled with specs, again, technical specs, that's it. And then I thought, okay, I need to get my information to them. Somehow I have to do this. So here's the interventions of Vera Collaborative. I propose a deep consideration of the technology. As an art historian, that is a part of what I do. We look at mediums also. We want to know what does that medium do? How does that impact the image or whatever is being made? And, and you know, what can it do? And why is the artist choosing to do this particular thing with it? We study mediums. They don't study mediums. Um, 
I promote, Vera Collaborative promotes meaningful collaborations with specialists like art historians who study technologies and in and of themselves. What I do is I embed myself on teams with engineers, computer scientists, um, archivists, and librarians so that I can speak to the questions that were not addressed when my microfilm was chosen, in, essentially. So, okay, some of the projects I'm working on now, I am a part of a team with a three-year um, grant with the National Park Services. We are charged to develop a cutting-edge digital asset management system for the Mary McLeod Bethune Archives. I gave a presentation at the National Park Services. They immediately understood what I was talking about. Because when you show them the newspapers, it's obvious that there are issues there. I'm also working on a two-year grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services IMLS, which focuses on piloting an online national collaborative network um, for integrating computational thinking into library and archival education and practice. So what this means is that I'm working on a team with um, educators in library science and archival training schools and programs. And I'm putting together with some computer scientists and engineers um, ways to think about um, comp making a collection ready to be used computationally. But within that, I am in, in talking about the ethics of those representations that get made. So in that way, the goals of and the interventions that I'm making are being disseminated because they will be used in the training of students who are learning library science and how to be archivists. I've done presentations at the Library Congress, um, at the you know, National Park Services, at the Maryland State Archives, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers Annual Conference. Um, actually, I'm speaking there again um, in December. King's College London, the British Library, the Alan Turing Institute had held a conference on computational archival science, and that's, I presented there also. So in conclusion, technology is not neutral. Its creation and use occur in specific social contexts. There are biases built into technology and what it produces. Decisions and technology impact how people are portrayed and remembered. The failure to interrogate technology and racial beliefs resulted in an erasure of the U.S. historical record. This is systemic racism. It doesn't have to be this way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for a very fascinating talk. I wish people could be here to touch the newspapers and see them themselves, because you know it is a material object, as you say, but we can certainly see the difference between uh, what you've shown us there and the microfilm. And we do have some questions coming in, so I would like to start with a question from Paul Connick. Uh, in your experience, are the photo archives of the original photographic images from which newspaper and magazine images were derived as depleted as the newspaper and magazine archives themselves? If so, can those articles be reconstructed using more faithful reproductions of the original photographic images? Okay, um, there are two repositor newspaper repositories in the United States. One of them is at the University of Utah and the other one is at Duke University. If those sites don't have the newspaper, okay, so you're talking about reproducing the newspaper from a photographic archive. Okay, that means you're gonna, you will need, in order to see what people saw at the time, you'll need the same kind of press that they were using in that moment. And you'll need the same kind of paper they were using in that moment. There are a lot of particularities to that. And I suppose it's possible if you could locate all those things. 
but that would be the way to go. So the point is that. that even if you got the negative and the positive of the photo photograph itself, that's still not what's being seen by the people who no. are looking at the newspaper because of the photograph process. They're not looking at a photographic yeah. archive. They're yeah. looking at a newspaper. Yeah. And this, they're looking at a newspaper. Right. And so you really need to see the newspaper. A photographic archive is going to have a different type of photographic mm -hmm. image than what you see in a newspaper. Print it completely differently. Thank you for that. And thank you, Paul, for that question. Thank you. Our dear friend Lloyd Kramer has a question. Does this project show how systemic racism and unconscious or unexamined racial presuppositions shape historical memory? The structures of knowledge therefore help to define the memory and meaning of knowledge even before the knowledge is developed? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Lloyd. That is exactly what happens here. We look at this and we think, we walk away thinking, this is what people saw. This is, this is, this particular, that's the newspaper. And that's not even the newspaper. The newspaper is the newspaper. Mm -hmm. These are all representations. There is an, um, an archivist, Paul Conway, who introduced some art historical ideas into um, archival science, he introduced some ideas around the notion of a representation. What is a representation? And, the, and he asserts, argues that archivists are making new representations and they need to be thinking about everything that goes with being a person who makes a representation. But yes, these are the images that people c come across on a daily basis and these are the images that are shaping scholarly work, um, all different types of, of research, as well as perceptions. And this is a distortion. And that is what people are consuming. And it's really horrifying. So I have a question for you, if you'll indulge me. I'm curious about. Um, the uh, growth of the popularity of the uh, black athlete in the United States. So nine years after this Paris match, we have Jesse Owens uh, in 1936. Um, do you, can you give us a corollary of how Jesse Owens was, you know, people were very proud of Jesse Owens for, uh, you know, what he had done and giving poo poo to Hitler, etc. Uh, and I know I've seen images in perhaps Life magazine or some magazine of Jesse Owens. Can you give us a little bit of talk of the trend of, of how the black athlete was portrayed in American newspapers? Were they using photogravure? Uh, were they uh, some corollary to think about? And I'm thinking of signaled uh, black athletes like uh, Jesse Owens and then perhaps Jackie Robinson. Okay, sure. Um, Jesse Owens is an interesting case because in 1936, the photographer Lenny Riefenstahl did a whole series of photographs where she too was glamorizing all the athletes, aestheticizing all of the athletes. But again, and, and that's 1936. This is 1927. This is circulating. She has, and her images, what she did, um, The Triumph of the Will, a whole sure. film on this, which is a whole series of these aestheticized images of athletes, which completely changes how phot sports photography is done. Very, very, very influential. But a lot of people, I'm not quite sure if she's, her work is the influential work, or this work is the influential work. That's what I'm, I'm looking into that right now. Because I know the editor of Match L'Entrant has a long established relationship with the editor of the New York Times that goes back to the 1880s. Mm -hmm. And I know that this is in circulation in France, the French colonies in Africa and the, and the French colonies in the Americas. So I know that, and I know that he's bringing this into the U.S. when he comes to visit and work with the New York Times. So I'm not sure where it could be coming from both places, mm -hmm. but between the two of them, they slowly, and it's a slow process because there are cultural mores in the United States that still prohibit 
an aestheticizing mm -hmm. to happen. Um, I am st I'm still in the process of trying to find who started to do that first. I know that there are images. I have some images of Joe Lewis on the cover of this. So I know that what's happening in Europe, but I haven't found any images of Joe Lewis or other athletes that are asked yet. Don't worry, just a few. Thank you for that. Sorry about that. <laughs> we'll get a new clip. Oh, that's okay. Um, so um, I know that there are. I have seen images of later images of Muhammad Ali. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen many of the earlier athletes that are photographed in that style. There's I have some images of Paul Robeson mm -hmm. as a football player, but they're not in that style. And that's the same period. Or like Leontine Price or someone like that, or, uh, you know, uh, opera singers or. Oh, women. Yeah. Who are non-athletes? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I've seen them. Yeah. But not the athletes yeah. and not the black men. Yeah. So, I mean, not black men or women for that matter. And just one other add on to that. Is it possible? Uh, when does the technology change? Um, so glossy magazines, Life magazine and glossy color photographs. Is that a different process that's being that's used? That's rotogravure. It really? Okay. That's so rotogravure. This opens the way to the large glossy photo yeah, magazine. Like you were saying. It so. had to be. Rotogravure was the only way they could have done and that. Could you give us some dates on when rotogravure was really being used? Because I, I assume they're not using rotogravure anymore. I worked no, in a newspaper. No, now they're we using were offset. <laughs> yeah, well, now they're using, it's all digital. Yeah, it's they're all digital, digital now. Um, rotogravure was actually invented in the late 19th century by um, a man who was living in Austria who wanted to print photographs onto textiles. He moved to the UK, did a lot of experimentation there, and sort of perfected that way of printing. He wanted to print on oil cloth, to be specific. Mm -hmm. And then he, for whatever reason, he decided to print something on paper and saw what that image looked like and started to experiment that way. I would say, okay, in 1926, there were only four publications in France using rotogravure. Ten years later, um, it's pretty widespread. Fascinating. Yeah, and, and you, it picked up a lot of speed. I mean, New York Times got it in 1914. There's the, they were printing the rotogravure section, which was where they printed, where they um, featured celebrities. Mm -hmm. Rotogravure was a part of the way of creating this celebrity this image of a celebrity. Uh, and then there, of course, there's that, um, the Easter parade, that song where they say, you know, if you look a certain way and you look really good, you'll be, you'll appear in the rotogravure. I mean, it's a technical term that gets incorporated into popular culture. I guess I never realized yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> it gets inter incorporated into popular oh, culture cool. because of the attraction to what it made people look like, how it could be manipulated to People identified it with celebrity. So I have a question here from John Blythe. Um, I oversee a newspaper digitization project at UNC's Wilson Library where we have been scanning newspapers in a variety of other formats for more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. We have scanned newspapers from microfilm because of the requirements of our grant from the National Digital Newspaper Program. Mm -hmm. But we also scan newspapers from the print editions. Yes. These include such African-American titles as the Carolina Times printed in Durham. In some cases, the photographs are poor quality in the originals. Consequently, scanned images will also be poor. So that was a statement. But do you have any comments on just the challenges of if you have a even yeah, in the original? Yeah, if you're printing, if you're if your original is if you're pr and you saw what halftone looks like for black people, and I have another example. This is a sports newspaper that's printed in halftone, and there's Al Brown. It's not going to look good even if it's digitized. Can I digitized. hold it up closer to the camera yes. so people can see that? It doesn't matter if it's digitized. It's not going to look good. Paul, is that, can you see that, Paul? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, it really doesn't. Halftone, depending on the technology, 
it just doesn't translate the tonal range. So it doesn't matter if you're going to go look for it. If you're doing the digitization process and the original thing when it's put in the paper is of poor quality, like John had said, there's nothing yes. you can do you're going to get, a, and if you're using high resolution, you're going to get a high resolution of a poor quality And that's image. when... That's when we'll send Paul Connick to find the original picture, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, but they have been doing a lot of um, really good work in terms of digitizing yeah. here. I talked to Nick Graham, what, four years ago really? when I first started this. Well, we love our libraries and, and archivists here, and we know that they're very yes. sensitive to these issues. Exactly. You know, of course, the technologies are there with limitations. Exactly. But at the same time, again, he spoke about the fact that the, the grant required that he digitize yeah. microfilms. Yeah, and, and John just has a little add-on. He okay. says, yes, sadly, until recently, the preservation emphasis was on the written content, not the images. Yes. Which is very disappointing for an art historian. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> In fact, it should be disappointing for everybody well, because how often does somebody tell you something but show you something, a different behavior? Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. Most images, images may or may not align with the text that they accompany. You need both to really see the meanings. I, that I are can think of some cliches about a thousand words, etc., yes. etc. Et <laughs> so, um, Lloyd has another question: Does current technology of phones and social media carry the same issue of distorted racial images as you have found in 20th century newspapers? Is this problem continuing in the 21st century? Um, some of the technology does carry that through, and I mentioned before um, that. Ava DuVernay speaks about the understanding of how to light in both ways. It still happened. There was an issue of Vogue magazine that came out this summer with Simone Biles on the cover, shot by Annie Leibovitz. So many protests. People were, it, was, it blew up Twitter because it's dark. It's too dark. It's, she looks so dark and muted, and that didn't have to look like that. It's just not lit. It, it's not lit for her skin. I think we're trying to find the image that we'll be able to show it to yes, everybody. Yes, on, on the cover of Vogue magazine. So, uh, you know, you had mentioned something about the way the magazine feels, um, and mm -hmm. I'm curious about that. How, oh, yeah. Yeah, the satiny thing. You were going to tell us that. So how yes. do we get the satin feel of the paper? There's a clay coating on this paper. I did some research on papers, newspapers, and, and um, transformative technologies at the Getty Conservation Center in 2016. I had a fellowship there. And we found that there is a clay coating on mm. this newspaper, which gives this weight and yeah. really enhances the whole notion of this as being a luxury item. Does it, uh, does it impart any sepia, kind of? The, is it a, a no. clear coating so you can't see? It has no effect on the coloring? No, it has no effect on the Interesting. coloring. Interesting. No effect on the coloring. So c coatings on paper, yeah, I mean, a lot of that, you, you have to, you can only pick that up if you mm. have the physical copy. I mean, this is sort of, this is the kind of thing that Rotogravure could do that none of the other newspapers could do. Mm. Same with this. Yeah, very interesting. It's it's amazing how the materiality of this is is just has such, such a an, critical piece. Has an absolutely critical. And piece. I I don't think we should keep every newspaper. I'm certainly not advocating for that. But what I am advocating for is the is to engage meaningfully engage people who have skills around visuality in the decision making processes so that there is an understanding of how that material might be used in the future mm -hmm. so that you think about a different kind of technology or the kind of things that I'm doing in Vera Collaborative, which is to get in on the beginning of when you create a digital asset management system and, and collaborate with the engineers and the computer scientists so that the ethical um, responsible ways are embedded in the technology itself. That's what we're doing in that project. So I just want to let uh, our audience know, and Paul has also put it up there, that uh, there's an article in Vox that explains why 
uh, the uh, Simone Biles cover was so, with pictures and examples of it. So uh, you might agree with it. You can check it out as well, see if you agree with what the Vox explainer is telling <laughs> us about what's wrong with this picture. Um, but it is very interesting. I'm curious, um, uh, we're running, we're uh, just about at the end of our program here, but I'm just curious about your course on art, history, and sports. Yes. And I'm wondering what other themes you focus on. Uh, what, what is the intersection between art, history, and sports? We certainly see it in this presentation. Are there some other issues that you cover that, that we should be aware of that we can bring you back for another talk on? Oh, sure. <laughs> well, um, I really put a lot of emphasis on, I mean, I think about technology. Technology is very important. I also think about um, in terms of the space. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the vantage points. I'm thinking about how stadiums construct a per particular perspective, how drone cameras construct the representation of what it's capturing in, in those, those types of images. I am thinking about uniforms mm. i'm thinking about um let's see museum exhibitions of mm -hmm. sports i'm thinking about let's let's see i mean i start in at the in the mesoamerican ball courts oh wow because that was where rubber was coming from in the first place. I mean, I'm, I'm starting with those stadiums and I'm thinking about sound because they're built in a way so that sound can bounce and bounce off so that the sound can travel and they have spaces for people to gamble. There's spaces for people to eat, you know. Also, the arrangement of the Mesoamerican ball court is incorporated into, in many ways, into the stadium um, stadiums that we have as opposed to the Coliseum. The Coliseum is a rounded stadium and the Mesoamerican ball courts are rectangular with an end zone, just like the football fields are. So I, I look at spaces, I look at um, tech, different types of mediums and technology. So I'm looking at lithograph. I look at the intersection of photography with the baseball card. Oh, wow. I look at the way that, um, and the lithograph, and how that intersects with late, late 19th century and early 20th century portraiture. So... It like, sounds like a great course, and it sounds like we do have lots of topics we can bring you back <laughs> to talk about, for sure. It's a lot of fun. I really love well, teaching I, that class. I want to thank you for coming and doing this. I want to thank you for persevering with us, uh, getting this thank done. You, you know, it's, we'll get it done. And this is, it, like you said, it's kind of perfect that we're doing it yeah. through this weird mitigated right. technologies and yes. whatnot. But uh, yes. it was lively, and you were doing it live. Uh, even, although the, you can't hear the resounding applause, we can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> virtually so um ladies and gentlemen please put your hands together for dr lanice williams it's been a fascinating talk we'll have you back soon thank and you folks want to so thank much. you yeah thank you and thank I you so much i hear the applause it. yeah exactly <laughs> uh and uh, we want to thank all of you for coming today i want to thank paul bonici for his wonderful work uh, as always on technology and vicky breeden back at the mother base uh helping us out of course lloyd kramer piping in we can't we can't live without you lloyd keep the questions coming uh, and uh, we're so thankful for all of you. Please join us. I know I've listed a bunch of programs out there that we have coming up. Uh, consider this uh, on the elections next Tuesday night in particular uh, should be of, uh, of great interest. And, of course, all of the, uh, the programs, the Ida B. Wells Symposium piece on Sunday, Richard Talbert next Tuesday, Brett Whalen Wednesday. Oh, boy, programs after programs. Go to humanities.unc.edu to check it out. And, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for Humanities in Action Fall 2020 signing off. We appreciate it. We'll see you at other programs soon. Thank you.